Okay, um, so thanks everyone for, for having me here. Um, we're going to talk about contravariance. A couple of disclaimers before we get started. Um, this is my first conference talk, so if you have any feedback afterwards, if you think um, you know, there's anything I could change to make the talk better, um, you know, I'll be very happy to, to hear that. And I'm also primarily a Scala 2.13 uh, user, so I've translated the code in my slides to Scala 3. Um, but again, you might you know, spot the occasional typo. Um, or some things that are not fully, you know, Scala-free idiomatic um, constructs. So again, I'll be very grateful, you know, if you, if you let me know afterwards if you spot anything like this. Um, the motivation and audience for the talk. So honestly, the origin of the talk are, are pretty humble. Um, a few months ago, one of my junior colleagues walked up to me uh, and she asked me point blank, can you tell me what's contravariance and can you give me a couple of examples? Um, and I didn't have a good answer on the spot. Um, and that made me feel a little bit crap because, you know, as the team lead, I'm supposed to sort of know what I'm talking about, or at least pretend I do. Uh, and on that case, I couldn't. Um, and so I had to, you know, go back home, think, sit down for a couple of hours, um, think of a few good examples to give her, and then come back to her the next day. Um, and I thought, well, A, she can't possibly be the only one in that position. Um, there might be more developers, either new to Scala or... Um, yeah, that just haven't come across contravariance yet and that don't fully understand it. Uh, and there might also be more, you know, experienced Scala developers like myself, who even though they feel comfortable working with contravariance day to day, um, when put on the spot, are not very comfortable explaining it um, to one of our colleagues. So hopefully whichever of these two categories you fall into, uh, you'll get something out of this talk. The outline is the following. We'll quickly go through some prerequisites. There's not too many, uh, don't worry. Then we'll go through an intuition building example where I'm going to use the stereotypical um, subtyping example. We're going to use an animal type with some concrete subtypes, and we're going to look at a couple of type classes. Um, and this is a bit of a toy example, but really the idea is to give you something that's easy to memorize and that's intuitive to think about. Um, so that if at some point later you need to try and remember, okay, when do I use covariance, when do I use contravariance, you can try and think back to this example, and it should be simple enough for you to work back just using logic, um, what makes sense in your particular use case. We'll look at a couple of practical use cases of contravariance after that, and then we'll end by asking ourselves, okay, but what, what is it about contravariance that actually makes it so, so difficult? Why is it that people seem to grasp invariance and covariance pretty easily, um, but they somehow stumble upon contravariance? Um, and I don't have a definitive answer for that, but I have a couple of hypotheses. Right, so the prerequisites to follow along with this talk are pretty basic. Um, one, you need to understand subtyping. So if I show you something like this, uh, you must be familiar with it. In Scala 2, you may have used um, a sealed trait or a sealed abstract class. Here, I've chosen to use an enum, um, but we have this parent type animal, and it has two concrete subtype, um, cat and dog. And one thing that must come to mind as soon as you see this is this idea of substitution. So you should know that if dog is a subtype of animal, um, which we denote like this in Scala with this little operator, then whenever in your code you need an instance of animal, you could instead pass an instance of dog. So you could do something like this. You could declare a val of type animal and you could pass it to dog and that's going to work. So that's the first thing you should be comfortable with. Um, the second thing is type classes. Or if you don't know that they are called type classes, think of them as traits that take one or more type parameters. Um, and then you can declare instances of each trait for some generic type and they provide you some functionality for that type. So I've given the example of a JSON encoder here in this case, um, which has a single method that allows you to encode an A, whatever you make A to be. Into, um, into a JSON. And we de declare instances as follows. Um, if I wanted to declare an instance for animal here, um, I'd do it this way in Scala 3 using given and with um, keywords, and I would have to provide an implementation for, um, for the encode method. Um, in Scala 3, you may also have seen the following syntax with extension um, methods, which as far as I understand, is roughly equivalent to what we do in Scala 2 um, with implicit classes or the pimp my library pattern. Um, but yeah, if you do something like this, it just gives you some synthetic sugar um, so that instead of having to summon the instance of your, of your type class and then call dot encode and pass it an animal, you could simply, whenever you have an instance of animal, just call dot encode on it um, and that should work. Right, so that's all you need. Um, if you understand these two things, then you know everything um, that you need to follow the rest of the talk. So let's dive into the first example. Uh, so we're going to look at this, this animal type. And we're going to take a look at two type classes. One of them is going to be a rescue um, type class that has an adopt method. Um, so in, in order to adopt an instance of A, 
you just need to provide a name and you'll get an A back. Um, and then we'll look at a second type class, which is a clinic, where you can bring a patient of type A um, and you can get some sort of examination report, which here will take the form of a string, um, some sort of statement about the health of, of patient, um, patient A. Um, I should say before going forward that um, even though I did come up with that example, I realized a few days before this talk that um, Daniel from Rock the JVM has a YouTube video where he uses a very similar example to explain contravariance. Um, so if somehow, you know, you're still confused about contravariance after this talk, try and um, check his video out on, on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's really good. Um, okay, so let's look at the first one of these. So I could define an instance of my rescue um, type class for dog. Um, and that should be pretty straightforward. The constructor of dog takes just two, two inputs. It takes a name, which is provided in the um, input to the adopt method, and it takes a breed. Um, and you, know, you don't get to specify anything about the breed in the signature to adopt. And since it's a rescue, it seems sensible that you, know, you shouldn't have too much choice anyway, so the, the breed is picked at random. We could also provide an implementation for the animal type. Um, and again, in this case, you don't get too picky. We know that an animal is going to be either a cat or a dog, but there's no way for you to specify that when you call adopt. Um, so it's going to be at random. Half the time, you're going to get a cat. Half the time, you're going to get a dog. Um, right. So let's, let's try and work through a first problem together. Um, let's say that somewhere in my code, I want to adopt an animal. And I'm not too picky. I'm happy with either a cat or a dog. Um, so I'm probably going to write a function that looks like this. I'm going to have an adopt function that takes um, takes an M and then it's going to require an instance of this rescue uh, for the type animal and it's going to return me an animal. And yeah, the implementation is super straightforward. Um, I did a quick um, Google yesterday trying to look for like typical British pet names. Apparently Poppy is the most popular dog name in the UK and it is also a valid cat name. Um, so I went with Poppy. Um, all right, slightly prob slight problem here. So I want to adopt an animal but in the area where I live, there are only dog rescues. Um, and so the question is, will this actually work? Can I actually get this code to work? Um, so will this code compile? Well, on my first attempt, no. And the first error that you get is not particularly helpful. Um, you just get told, well, I need an instance of rescue animal. You haven't provided me this. Um, before we try and go any further, um, it might make sense to try and check that what we're trying to do makes sense um, to begin with. So I want to adopt an animal. We said that dog is a subtype of animal. Um, so the question is, can I actually adopt an animal from a dog rescue? Right. Um, if you think about it for a second, yeah, that seems sensible. Um, a dog rescue is perhaps more specific than what I was looking for. I said I was happy with either a cat or a dog. And dog rescue is only going to provide me a dog, but hey, it fits the requirement. Um, that should be fine. So the answer is yes. Um, it's usually, I usually like to try this exercise the other way around, because um, normally when we think of substitution, it should work in one direction, but not in the other. Um, so if we try and do this the other way around, and I start with a statement um, saying that I want to adopt a dog. And again, dog's a subtype of animal. Um, and I ask the question, OK, can I actually ad adopt a dog from an animal rescue? Um, in this case, if we think about it for a second, the answer is no. Right. If you remember the implementation of animal rescue, there's no way for you to specify exactly what you're going to get. Um, you may get a dog, but you may also get a cat. You probably wouldn't be too happy with it. Um, so the answer is no, it doesn't work in this particular direction. OK, um, but we've worked out that for the particular use case we have, it should work, at least from a logical standpoint. You know, it's, it's, it holds up. Um, so I should be able to use an instance of rescue dog in place of an instance of rescue animal. Um, and the first thing I can try and do is I can try and force the compiler to do this. Um, I can try and explicitly give it the instance that I wanted to try using. And of course, this still doesn't compile. Um, the error that I get is the following, which is really just saying, hey, um, I found an instance of rescue for dog, but I actually want you to give me an instance of rescue for animal. Um, now, this is the error that I get in Scala 3. And I don't know, I might be missing a compiler flag or something like that. But the message I used to get in Scala 2.13 was actually a little bit more helpful than that. Um, so the compiler in Scala 2.13 used to tell me not only what the problem was, but it would actually try and give me a hint as to how I could fix it. Um, so it would say, hey, I actually noticed that dog's a subtype of animal, um, but your rescue type here is invariant in type A. So actually, I think you should try and do um, this thing here at this little plus uh, symbol, which um, you might know already is, is covariance. 
Um, so we've worked out that what we're trying to do here is sensible, but how do we convince the compiler that it's sensible? How do we get the compiler to actually accept that? Um, well, you know, the same way we had to make dog a subtype of animal to convince the compiler that whenever I need an instance of animal, um, I should instead be able to give it an instance of dog. We need to convince the compiler that um, rescue dog is a subtype of rescue animal. Uh, and if we can convince the compiler of that, then it's going to accept what I'm trying to do. Um, and the way to do this is to add this little plus there. And that little plus will make your type class covariant in A. And what covariance implies is that if you have a relationship between two types, so you have dog being a subtype of animal, um, then that relationship is propagated to your type class um, in the same direction. So rescue of dog becomes a subtype of rescue of animal, um, and we should be able to get our code to compile. Um, and in fact, if we try, this compiles. Um, but like, even better, I don't need to explicitly pass the instance of rescue dog. The compiler is now clever enough um, to work out, okay, I needed an instance of rescue animal. I haven't found this, but hey, I found something that I can substitute instead. I found an instance of rescue dog, and that works all fine. Okay, so that was covariance, um, which is usually, you know, it's, it's the, the cousin of contravariance. It's usually the one that's slightly easier and more intuitive to understand. So hopefully, so far, everything made sense. Um, so as a quick recap before we go into contravariance, invariance is what we started with. Um, so there's no plus or minus before your type parameter here. Um, and the implication of invariance is even though you may have some relationship um, between your types, such as one being a subtype of the other, um, there's absolutely no relationship here between rescue dog and rescue animal. They're totally different types and you can never substitute one um, for the other. And we fix that by using covariance. Um, which is designated by you know, adding this little plus here in front of your type parameter. Um, and with covariance, then this relationship, this link of parenthood um, between your two types is propagated to your type class. Uh, and that's what allowed us to use an instance of rescue dog instead of an instance of, of rescue animal. Okay, let's look at um, the next type class, which is the clinic type class. Um, so clinic yeah, allows us to bring in a patient of type A and it's gonna print um, it's going to return us yeah, some statement about the health of, of that patient. Um, again, we can try and first see how we define implementations of this type class. So for dog, pretty straightforward, um, just return a string with maybe the name of the dog and maybe the breed. Um, and we could also define one for animal. In the case of animal, we might want to use pattern matching um, so that we can have a slightly different behavior depending on what specific subtype of animal we've got. Um, so we're going to print slightly different things for, for cat versus dog here. Um, but still pretty straightforward to implement. All right, so let's work through a second problem. Um, I want to take my dog for a checkup at the vet. So I'm going to have the following function. Um, examine takes a dog. Um, it, of course, needs an instance of a clinic for dog. I'm going to return a string. Um, very straightforward to implement. I'm going to declare an instance of a dog um, called Medor, which I think is the archetypal French name um, for a dog. So we'll have Medor de Labrador. And I want to bring in Medor for an examination. All right. Slight problem. Um, there are only animal clinics in the area where I live. I don't have access to a dog clinic. So again, um, let's try and work out whether we can get this code here to compile. Um, at first, no. And again, at my first attempt, the compiler is not super helpful. It just tells me, well, I haven't found a clinic dog. So um, yeah, that's not going to work. Um, but let's first see, are we even trying to do something sensible here? So I want to take my dog for a checkup. Um, and dog is a subtype of animal. Can I take my dog to an animal clinic? Right. And again, um, think about it for a second. An animal clinic is something more powerful than what I really require. Right? It does more than what I need but it does what I need. If they can treat both cats and dogs, um, surely they should know what to do with my dog. So that's absolutely sensible. Um, and again, it should just be a matter of figuring out how do we get the compiler to, accepting, to accept um, what we're trying to do here. Um, again, I like to always to convince myself um, of which way, you know, what can you substitute for what. I like to do the exercise the other way around. Um, so if we assume for a second that I had animals, maybe I have a cat and a dog, um, both of which are subtype animal, could I take them to a dog clinic? And, and the answer, obviously, in this case would be no. They wouldn't know what to do with the cat that I bring in. So the substitution works one way. It doesn't work the other way. 
Um, all right, but we've worked out that the way we're trying to do it, um, at least logically, it should work. Um, so how do we convince the compiler to let us do that? So again, I can try by just forcing the compiler to accept an instance of clinic or animal, um, and it's not going to like that. And again, it's going to serve me a, a similar error as what we saw in the previous example. Um, it's going to tell me, well, you've given me an instance of clinic animal, I want an instance of clinic dog. Um, in Scala 2.13, it was slightly more helpful than that. And it used to tell me, again, the problem is, look, clinic is invariant in type A. I think you should do that instead. You should add this little minus sign, um, which means make clinic contravariant in type A. Uh, so finally, we get to contravariance. So we worked out this should work um, in theory. In practice, how do we get the compiler to accept it? Uh, well, in order for me to be able to use an instance of clinic animal, where I need an instance of clinic dog, and the only way to do that is to make clinic of animal a subtype of clinic dog. Uh, and at this point, you might you might start real you might realize why this is called contravariance is um, we've propagated, if you will, the link of, of parenthood between dog and animal, but we've kind of swapped it. So whereas dog was on the left hand side and animal on the right hand side before, now they've very inverted. Um, yeah. So if we make this change now, um, just add this little minus sign here in front of the A type parameter, we have now got a contravariant um, type class. Um, yeah, with the relationship between dog and animal being inverted um, when we put those inside that clinic type class. Um, and we should be able to get our code to compile. Um, I don't know if I've added a snippet here, but yeah, that that's code will compile what we had before um, at this point. Um, so that is, that's contravariant. Okay, so um, the example I just gave you is a little bit of a toy example. I imagine most of you don't work with, with domain models um, involving animal in your day-to-day -day life. Um, it's hopefully just a simple example that you can, you know, you can remember easily um, and go back to if at some point you need to work out um, which way was it again, okay? Where, when do I use, you know, contravariance? When do you use covariance? Um, but what might be interesting now is to actually look at where do you even find contravariance in practice? Um, so there's two, two places really where I've run into it. There might be more than that, um, but there's two where they're fairly common. It's fairly common to encounter it. Uh, the first one is in Codex. So I've given you here uh, two type classes that are pretty much taken straight out of the Cersei library. You have an encoder uh, type class and then a decoder type class. And the decoder is covariant, the encoder is contravariant. Um, if you are not familiar with this kind of codec library, uh, basically, the idea with Codex um, is you move between least structured forms of data to more structured um, forms of data. So the least structured data you could think of is a string or probably an array of bytes. Um, and the most structured form of data you could have uh, is some sort of user-defined type, probably an ADT, uh, something like that. And you can also have intermediate representations of this data. Right? So a string could contain virtually anything. Um, but only string containing valid JSON will be parsable to an instance of JSON. Um, and then in turn, you may have a valid JSON, but it might not contain exactly the fields that you need to get an instance of A out of it. Um, so when you are decoding, which is moving from least to most structured forms of data, you have a chance of failure, um, which explains the signature of this decode method here, where maybe you get the result you wanted, or maybe you get a decoding error. Encoding is the other way around. You're moving from more structured data to least structured data. Um, and here, usually, you shouldn't have any failure. That, that way should be pretty straightforward. Um, so the signature here um, doesn't contain an error type. You just return directly your, your JSON type. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should have practiced with that screen. Sorry. So the, the decoder is uh, the covariant one. So there's a plus on the top one. And encoder is contravariant. It's a minus. Thank you for pointing this one out. Okay. Um, so we, I won't go through the decoder example. Um, if you know, you can practice this one on your own if you want to convince yourself that decoder should be covariant. Um, but yeah, uh, deco decoder is covariant. Um, let's have a look at the encoder instead. Uh, it's the more more interesting one. So here is again the definition of of my type class. I've also added a companion object with a summoner. Um, Summoner is just a very handy little method. It's going to look for the instance of my type class and return it uh, to me directly. And what it allows me to do is just get rid of that little summon keyword in Scala 3 or the implicitly keyword um, 
So a little bit of boilerplate goes away if I actually define this. Um, and we could work for an example. So I have a, an encode dog method that's going to take a dog and a JSON encoder of dog and just returns me a JSON. Um, and the implementation is, yeah, super straightforward again. Um, and so if I try to instant to encode an instance of my dog Midor, I obviously can do it, giving it a JSON encoder of dog. But again, to convince yourself that JSON encoder um, should be contravariant, try and think whether this would work with a JSON encoder for animal. Right? And just like the clinic use case, um, you can think of it as, OK, the JSON encoder for animal is more powerful than what I really need here. Um, it's capable of doing more than just what I require, but it does what I require. If it can encode any animal, including a dog, sure enough, it can do whatever JSON encoder does. Um, so I can use that as a substitute for a JSON encoder dog. Um, and that's, you know, when you realize you can substitute things this way around, that should be the clue that JSON encoder is contravariant. Uh, so that's one use case. Um, it's, yeah, whenever you look at codecs, whether they're for JSON or whatever other uh, data format, the encoder will usually be contravariant. Um, the show type class is another example of it. If you've come across that, right, you give it whatever A and it gives you a string representation of it. That's also something that um, should usually be contravariant. Um, yeah. The um, second one is function inputs. So if you've ever taken um, a look at what Scala really are, sorry, what functions really are in Scala um, under the hood, a Scala is some, a function is something like this in Scala. Um, so depending on the arity of a function, we have a different trait. Here, function one is a function that takes a single argument and returns one, one value. Um, and looking at a signature, you'll see that the input um, to function is, is contravariant and the output is covariant. Um, and yeah, we have, you know, depending on the RET, we have many different um, versions of this same trait. Um, and again, we can try and convince ourselves that, okay, is it sensible for the, um, for the inputs here to be contravariant? Um, so what does contravariance allow us to do? Well, it lets us, for example, um, it guarantees, for example, that a function one of animal and string is a subtype of a function one of dog and string. Um, and so it allows me to do the following. If I first declare a function that operates on animals, um, and I assign that to, to a value of this type, um, I can later reassign it to another val, uh, which this time is typed as function one, dog, um, and string. And again, um, if you pause for a second and think about this, that seems perfectly sensible. My function is capable of operating on any animal, um, so absolutely it can operate on any dog. That's totally um, logical to do that. Um, and if we look at the output type and reason maybe about the covariance here, um, what covariance on the output type implies is that if I have a function um, of type, uh, yeah, string and dog, it's a subtype of a function string and animal. Um, so again, I can try and do the same thing with this kind of function. If I have a function that always returns me dog, um, I absolutely can assign that to a val uh, that's type as a function that always returns animal. Uh, this way around is usually more intuitive. It's, it's a contravariant way that sometimes, yeah, throws people off a little bit. Um, but yeah, these are the two uh, most common use, use cases that I've come across at least. Uh, if you know any more, yeah, let me know after the talk. Um, so by now you might have started to spot a pattern. Uh, so you may have noticed that whenever we have a type parameter that's covariant, um, it tends to be something that we use as an output. So for rescue, um, our rescue type class of A returned us an A. Or JSON decoder of A returns us maybe a decode error or maybe an A. Um, and our function here always returns us an R. Uh, so yeah, covariance is typically something that's used for type parameters that represent outputs. And inversely, um, contravariance will be used for type parameters that represent inputs. Um, so our clinic took a patient of type A or JSON encoder, takes an instance of type A and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. So that seems pretty sensible, right? That, that seems pretty straightforward when you put it this way. Uh, why, why is contravariance so hard? Why is that the case then, um, if it's so straightforward? Um, well, the first reason might be that it's just far less common than covariance. Um, so covariance is something you're going to come across pretty early in your Scala journey. Uh, if you look at collections, so a list, for example, is usually defined with a covariant uh, type parameter A. Um, if you look at error types as well, so you look at option, you look at either, a try, um, they all use covariance as well. So it's far more widespread and it's something you'll come across um, quite early in your Scala journey. Uh, you may 
spend a few years writing Scala actually without coming across uh, contravariance, without at least having to use it yourself. You might use it without knowing it um, through some of the libraries you use, but yeah, you might, you might go a few years without really needing to understand it. Um, so I think that's one thing that makes covariance easier to understand. Um, and the second one is, this is a hypothesis, but I've caught myself doing that. Um, and again, I suspect I might not be the only one. I think that sometimes um, people attribute to covariance a behavior that really is provided by subtyping. Um, and it, this is not something you could do with contravariance. Uh, so what I mean by that is, well, let's, let's look at one example. Um, let's take a type class func here. Um, so that's a function that takes zero argument, always returns you an R. And I've made this covariance. Um, how come I'm able to do something like this? How come I'm able to declare an F of type func animal um, and then give it an implementation that always returns a dog instead of an animal. This is thanks to subtyping, not thanks to covariance. Um, it might seem super straightforward with a simple function like this one, but when you have a much longer function that goes over quite a few lines of code, um, it's not always as easy to spot. Um, so this behavior is purely thanks to subtyping. In fact, if you want to convince yourself of it, um, just update func to be invariant and your code will still compile. Um, but what I sometimes see people try to do, and what I've caught myself doing, in fact, is try and make a type class here that's contravariant, and then go, okay, I've made R contravariant, right? Um, can I, whenever I need an, uh, an instance of dog, can I give an instance of animal instead? Can I try and do this thing um, right here? And obviously this will never work, right? This should never work um, unless you try and do some unspeakable things with as instance of or <laughs> this, this sort of stuff. This should never compile. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the reasons uh, people get confused about contravariance. They assume this might be something contravariance allows them to do. So if this behavior here is provided by subtyping, then what does covariance give me instead? So covariance would allow me to do something like that. So I've declared my f now this time as a func um, of type dog. Um, and the implementation is super straightforward, nothing, you know, nothing unusual here, I'm returning a dog. Um, but what I can do here instead is I can declare a higher order function, which is a function returning a function of animal. Um, and I'm allowed in the implementation of this higher order function to return my func of dog here. And the only reason I'm able to do that is not because of subtyping. This time it's because of covariance, right? I can do this because func of dog is a subtype of func animal. And again, if you want to convince yourself of this, try and make func invariant and this particular part of the code will stop, stop compiling. Uh, yeah. All right, so as a quick recap, uh, yeah, this is, so invariance, first thing we started with, uh, yeah, no symbol here in front of the type parameter, and no relationship whatsoever. You might have relationship um, between your types, such as dog and animal, but no relationship between instances of your type class for dog uh, and instances of your type class for animal. You cannot substitute one for the other, whichever direction you're going. Covariance, um, the relationship between dog and animal is propagated as it is into your type class. Um, so it's in the same direction. Um, and now you could use an instance of your type class for dog in place of an instance of your type class for animal. Um, and covariance tend to be used for output type parameter. You'll typically find it when you have decoders or parsers and you'll find it in function outputs. And then contravariance, um, denoted by this little minus sign here. Um, so again, there's some relationship that's propagated into your, into your type class, but it flips um, direction. So now my type class instance for animal becomes a subtype of my type class instance for dog, and contravariant in something you will encounter in input type parameters. Um, so for example, whenever you have an encoder, or whenever you have a function input. Um, and that was it, hopefully. I don't know, hopefully it clarified a little bit um, contravariance for some of you. Um, but yeah, thank you very much um, for having me here. And I don't know if there's any questions you want to take. Uh, thank you very much. It was extremely clear. Um, I have a question uh, because I do not use uh, oriented object programming language. Uh, but when we see the, the case when we are covariant and contravariant, it seems that it should be mechanizable uh, because lack of abstraction. And I just seeing the implementation of a type class, and the 
definition of a tag class, I know that I can uh, have an ID if it's covariant or contravariant. And so it's not something that can be cool to just annotate invariance and inferring co and contravariance. Oh, so you'd like like the compiler to do it automatically, to yeah. infer? Um, I don't know if there's actually a way to do that in Scala, but I, I suppose it would be nice to have it, yeah? Okay. So remove some, yeah, I guess some headache. <laughs> Maybe do, do you have a case when you know that it should not be covariant? Oh, where I don't want to allow right. covariance. Um, I, don't, I don't have one in mind, no. Um, I think you, it should not be uh, inferred because if you have mutability in your type, if you have mutability in your type, it should not be uh, contravariant so, or covariant. Maybe, okay. For example, if you have a collection, you could put some, an animal in a list of dogs or, or, or a dog in a list of animals or something like that, and it should change the type if it was a mutable list. <coughs> Oh, I see. Okay, so if you have like a mutable collection. Yeah, if you have a mutable collection, it should not be covariant, even though generally collections are covariant. And okay. I think in, in some cases it might be like that, so you, the compiler should not infer it, in, just in case you don't want it to be uh, automatically activated. For. Actually, I think uh, you just cannot express uh, covariance with uh, such mutable uh, data structures. Um, for instance, uh, stdlib uh, mutable collections are, uh, are uh, invariant. And uh, I remember seeing some people trying to make uh, them covariant and uh, failing at it because I think it's just theoretically not possible, maybe. Thank you, Sophie.